we've asked this group of distinguished panelists uh, who have a role, except Rick, I'm not quite sure how if this is perfectly fits you, but as, as on the policy side of things. Um, and we, we asked all four of them to answer two questions. Uh, we'll try to answer, it's kind of a discussion. One is like, what do we know and not know about what works in education developing countries? And you get three minutes to answer that question. Um, and then the other seven minutes is how can researchers and, and uh, aid organizations or policy organizations work to improve research and eventually policy on education developing countries? So we're going to sort of go in order here. Um, I know Jishnu has a presentation, but I think the rest of us are just going to talk. Um, and then we'll open it up for discussion from the floor. Okay? Are you ready? It doesn't matter if you're ready or not, you have to start. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, distinguished um, conference. So the first thing I should say is, um, on the first question, what do we know and what do we not know about what works in education, I looked at the... Um, well, the mic is not turned on. Well, yes, press the button. Now I'll have one more thing that works after. Okay. Okay, can everyone hear me now? Okay, so thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thanks to everybody. Um, the first thing to say is, um, after having a look at the list of um, participants in the conference, I thought that to sit here and tell this audience what we know and what we don't know is probably not a good use of my time, considering um, the relative number of brains we've got in the audience. So I thought what might be a useful use of the time is to try and explain from the other side. So um, prior to joining DFID, I was an aspiring academic. Um, so I sort of can see how research and policy work from both sides. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to try and explain a bit more what we're looking at. Um, so I think the first thing to do is describe um, the role of DFID in the world of international development and the role of DFID in education. So we are increasingly um, increasing our budget and our expending on education to the extent that by 2014-15 we will be spending about a billion pounds on aid to education in developing countries. Um, of that, very little as it stands is on education research and we increasingly have a focus on evidence-based policy and using evidence to drive our program. So we have a vested interest in the research community and improving the quality of research as much as we can. So we operate in 23 countries um, from refugee camps in northern Kenya to giving budget support to Uganda, and we are trying to find good quality research to inform all of this. So we're focused broadly on improving learning, but also reaching the most marginalized and trying to place where we are in the world in 10, 15 years' time. So I think in the main, we are looking for research in two areas. One, there's a constant discussion, and especially when we move into the, uh, the post-2015 Millennium Development Goal agenda, on where education sits. So amongst this community, I think everybody's sold on the benefits to education, the fact we're here, we're self-selected into this group, but not everybody is. So I think we still need to do some research, and Rick has done some seminal research in this area on why education matters, what type of education matters, but also under what circumstances it does matter. Um, so. We, I feel we need more. We've got the role of education quality in productivity and economic growth, but we need to be clever in fitting education into an evolving development story. So I don't think anyone is convinced that if we just boost supply of education, even if we improve learning, the world's going to take off into a magic development path. So we need to be clever and think about how as development uh, stories evolve more generally, the institution-led growth argument, how do we place education in this? And also, under what conditions does education matter? Because the, the sad facts are um, the majority of people who leave school after primary school will go into agriculturally intensive labour. The type of education we need to provide for these people will be completely different to the education for the firm managers, for the 
middle manager. So I think we, we still, we've, we've made tremendous successes in justifying education to the broader development community, but especially when we come up to post 2015, we, we need to continue. Okay, so the second um, key question for us is, okay, so we've justified why education. So what should we actually do? What should we invest in? And the main point I want to make today is that we need to know what improves education, um, but we need to know how to actually do it and how to do it through our partners. So the majority of funding that DFID provides works through other people. We don't actually go and run education programmes ourselves. So this could be through government. I think still about two thirds of our expenditure goes through government. Um, the NGOs, the more traditional, Save the Children, Aga Khan Foundation, these implementers, but also increasingly through the private sector. So we need to know how to improve it through our partners um, and what the impact and the differential of impacts of programmes will be operating through these different partners. Um, so it's not as simple as knowing that a project works under experimental conditions, you know, Ceteris Paribus, all else held equal. That's unfortunately not enough for the policymaker these days. We need to know, well, what happens if we don't hold things equal? What happens if it's imp implemented by government? What happens if it's impl implemented in the private for-profit making sector? These questions are very pertinent. And one of the evolving criticisms as we get to the level now where we have very good internal validity of experiments, um, we need to know what happens if we relax this. Okay, so that was uh, essentially the main point I wanted to make. And I, I think this is a key value added of DFID in our engagement with the research community. Because the one thing we do have is engagement with government, engagement with different partners. So working together, especially at the design stage, I think is very important. Practically, it's always difficult because there's always a rush to implement and people speak different languages. Okay, so that was the first point and related to that is, I suppose, a question. So as economists, we've made tremendous sli uh, strides in uh, impact evaluation, internal validity and answering some questions which economists would answer. Um, I suppose my question is, do we have the right mix of methodologies um, to move from a control world into a system level improvement world? I, I don't know the answer. I'm hoping that people can think about this and see if we have the current uh, toolkit is sufficiently equipped to answer these questions. Okay, the other point I wanted to make, and this is um, as much due to the limitation of funding and timeframes as anything else, but one thing um, that really strikes us is quite how much dynamics matters. So when we talk about the private sector, what is the evolution of the market? You know, because this um, tells us what would happen if DFID or USAID intervene. You know, if you have a, a certain structure and you intervene with a development program, what happens with the private sector? Is the public sector going to stay inert? Is it going to react? We know, I think it was mentioned earlier about the grant aided schools in India and how they evolved to be no more effective than the uh, state sector, essentially. So if we intervene with, say, the private sector, two minutes, um, then what's going to happen? Are they going to say, well, look, we're being government funded, we want the government regulations? I think we are less good at answering these questions. But part of that is due to the lack of funding for long-term longitudinal studies. Okay, so the other point is we've been discussing um, a lot of DFID on doing more research into education systems, but I, I'd quite like to say, well, what does this actually mean? You know, what do we mean by an education system? And then you stop and you look across Europe and you see substantially different education systems, um, which all produce comparatively good outcomes. I mean, there is a range, um, but we'd still be quite satisfied if we got any African country up to any of these levels. So are we, by focusing on the observable characteristics of systems, missing a trick? Should we be focusing on what, what drives these systems? What's the interlinkage between the two, which takes us back into the political economy? What are the key components? I think these are questions which we're struggling to answer. Okay, and the final point I just wanted to make is, and this could just be my ignorance um, and my lack of knowledge about the... Um, the evidence, but it seems like a lot of the research is on basic education, and we need to know, okay, looking forward, there's a lot of demand from different partner countries on secondary education as well, 
And my gut instinct is the solutions for basic won't be the solutions for secondary in terms of access, in terms of quality, in terms of learning. So what are we doing to kind of future-proof our, our research and our policies? Um, and I'll leave it at that and pass across to Dishnu. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, I had a bit of a presentation tonight. I know whether you wanted to do that or... Um, in 10 minutes, sure. So just in terms of uh, what we know, I think, you know, we, I, I think the last decade has seen an explosion of um, research on education in low-income countries. And one of the ways we've been thinking about it is, uh, you know, I think there's now a lot of robust, you know, uh, robust uh, evidence that, that even very small levels of schooling can change life outcomes for, for people in pretty, uh, pretty dramatic ways. Um, and then there's this issue about, you know, when we start focusing in on smaller things like test scores for a limited time, uh, uh, you know, things, a lot of things seem to matter, a lot of things can change these things, but there's also a large set of inputs that don't appear to change uh, stuff, or at least for a longish period of time, where I think I've been uh, more interested in kind of drawing back almost 500 years, as you'll see, is, is, is really this question of uh, what do we fundamentally, how are we going to fundamentally decide whether an education system is working and, and what kind of fixing it needs? And that's kind of where we've been working a lot uh, on, on colleagues, which is, you know, really, uh, can we look at education systems that do not, are not systems? that are full anarchy and see what's going on. And that's what I think about kind of its tales from the Wild East. And this is really the argument we've been making that, you know, the World Bank at least used to think that we should be investing in villages like this with a single school, but these villages have changed. You know, a lot of, lot of countries, a lot of places now live in villages with multiple schools. Uh, private schools are really, really going up. Uh, and and uh, the growth is just not stopping. And that's kind of been interesting because what you get in these in these situations is really market determined pricing in the private schools with administrative pricing in public schools that are that are normally nominal or zero in, in, in a place like Pakistan. You get closed markets at the primary level because the, the children are all going to the schools in the village and the schools are all drawing from children in the village. And you get some de jure regulation and almost no de facto uh, regulation in the context I'm in. So that uh, one of the things we've been looking at is that these three features kind of allow us to look at deep uh, issues of naturally occurring variation in unsubsidized and unregulated markets. Not claiming anything close to all low-income countries being like this. We know they're not. In fact, there are few places in the world uh, where, where the system works like this. Uh, so. What we've kind of started to understand, and I think Karthik spoke to this and Rick spoke to this, is uh, you land up with two systems for comparison, and which can give you a better idea both of what some schools are maximizing, tell us a little bit more about what parents want, uh, start to understand the nature of market frictions, and start to get some idea going on what can be done. Right? So just to give you four examples, you, know, you have to ask this question of difference in outcomes between public and private schools. But you can also ask about what is it that parents want or children want, and how does that differ across parents and children. You can ask about what market frictions there are in these systems, and what kind of market level outcomes do you get from improvements in public schools, right? So just to give you a broad idea, you know, it, it turns out even after you look at selection and do things carefully with kind of at least IB strategies, uh, that these private schools have higher test scores, they have better civic values, they have lower costs, uh, and at least in our data, the way, when, you know, even at age 16, so this is 10 years after uh, we started, they seem to have some long-term outcomes. The, the interesting thing is this, which is when you try and do a kitchen sink regression, trying to say, okay, what is it about private schools that matter? Uh, it turns out that you can't explain much. And when you start asking people, and I've now interviewed almost uh, 150 head teachers on this, they all agree that teachers matter and hiring good teachers is key. They don't agree on anything else, right? So, so what seems to be happening is that the optimal package in these schools depends on the specific situations. And we have examples and things that different schools are doing. I went to one school where they put in a meal program because the harvest was poor, right? So 
you know, if the fundamental issue is that there's heterogeneity in the student body, and so institutional features are going to be important to examine in this context, you can start asking what is it that we should care about, uh, and why do we care about these public-private differences on particular dimensions, and that's where we go back almost 500 years, right? Because, uh, you know, it's in, in, in 1520, right? Martin Luther raised this issue about uh, he says it's you know to the German lords. He says it's to you, my lords, to take this task, education in hand. For if we leave it to the parents, we will die a hundred times over before this thing could be done, right? And then there's a protest from uh, Heidenheim in Germany, where they say our young people, most of whom have no aptitude for Latin, which is what was being imposed, and are growing up to be artisans, are better served by a German teacher than a Latin master, for they need to learn writing and reading. Uh, which is of great help to them. And of course, that's the theme that's going to recur again and again throughout history, right? So you get into the US, you know, Massachusetts teacher, 1850, uh, California state superintendent of public instruction. Uh, the vulgar impression that parents have a legal right to dictate to teachers is entirely erroneous, right? And of course, you know, as an Indian, we're a child of Macaulay, right? So Macaulay's minute, 1835, really defines for us education. And he's very clear. He says, I'm quite ready to take the Oriental learning at the valuation of the Orientalists themselves. I have never found one among them who could deny that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of, 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 of India and Arabia. Right? Uh, so he sets up a system that's very clear. In one point, I fully agree with the gentleman to whose general views I'm opposed. I feel with them that it's impossible for us with a limited means to attempt to educate the body of the people, right? I mean, this is the, 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 the British idea of, of what should be done. We must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, right? A class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste and opinions and morals and intellects, right? And since I was putting up that slide, I had to wear my Indian dress, right? I don't know. I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to put myself in a bad situation. So we can start asking, you know, what is it? So this question that Karthik was raising, English, Hindi, Telugu, it's an ancient question. It is not going to go away. It's kind of 600 years old, right? So you can start asking, what is it that parents want in this kind of situation? We're doing some work with Pedro Carniero and Hugo Ruiz at uh, UCL. In fact, they're doing the work, and I'm putting my name on it. Uh, but we've been kind of trying to estimate these structural choice models in, in, in these systems. And we typically find that even in Pakistan, with these completely unregulated things, parents value infrastructure, test scores. Uh, they really get hurt by prices and distance. And the price and quality elasticities are higher for the poor and for girls. And you know, you start using this stuff, and you start discovering that the private schools are actually not purely profit maximizing, because they're pricing in the inelastic part of their demand curves. Uh, and you start getting some ideas about uh, what kind of welfare gains you get from private schooling using this technology of kind of new goods, right? So some broad idea where you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm not going to worry about test scores, but I am going to worry about parental valuation as an as a overall uh, system. And you can start thinking about market frictions, right? So when you shock these entire markets with, with, with new information, it turns out that you reduce prices and you increase, uh, increase performance, right? And that broad story is pretty consistent with theories of, you know, pricing under asymmetric information, that you need to give an informational rent uh, to high-type schools uh, to get them to reveal their, their, their uh, quality or to get them to choose high quality. And it turns out that the, you know, one way perhaps to think about what's happening in these villages is it's fairly reasonable to think about these places as schooling with separating equilibria, uh, which are constraint efficient. I mean, it doesn't seem like there are huge problems with, with what, what's going on in these places. And it also turns out that schools are always reacting to what you know, others do. So when you give a lot of money to public schools and let them choose what they want to do with it, uh, you start getting spillovers on private schools that have to react to, to you know, not lose enrollment when the public school uh, thing goes up. Right? So just to kind of finish then, uh, you know, my, my agenda on this has been to try and think hard about uh, that this debate on, on what is it that parents want from schooling, what do we want from a schooling system, really boils down ultimately to who are we going to give some jurisdiction over where they want the schools to go. Right? And I think the two broad systems that have been used are some notions of administrative accountability, 
So you let the government or the inspectors or those things decide how you want your schooling system to function. We don't want any Hindi in our public schools, right? And then there's some democratic process through maybe which that, that can be channeled. It's a political system. Alternatively, you give over that, that, that broad flexibility to parents and let them choose among a variety of horizontally and vertically differentiated schools uh, that are offering different products, right? And I think that broad argument, which is if you're going to go down the second line, right? Can we use market shares? Can we use uh, revealed preferences over how people are choosing school as indicators of welfare is, I think, going to be one of the big uh, issues uh, thinking about this as it has been for the last 600 years on, on how to uh, think about these issues. So, you know, so, so really where uh, we have been kind of focused is to say what are the institutional features that we want to deal with and I think the, the idea that we have been trying to develop is, you know, it, to the extent that we can find, so this fundamental issue that it may not be, it doesn't seem like there's a lot when you start looking at it, that the parents are making crazy choices over what, what they want to do. And it might be worthwhile thinking hard about what are the market frictions in these systems, right? And how, you know, can they be alleviated and what, what, would, you, what would you require? And it turns out that, the, that I'm finished, uh, that one of the big uh, issues moving forward is any system where we have tried to publicly subsidize private schools uh, fails quite quickly, and 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 you know within about ten years or so is you know whatever we have uh, we have looked at, and part of the reason, of course, is any kind of public subsidy is a very blunt instrument, uh, whereas the pricing that we see in the private sector is a you know fairly sophisticated hedonic kind of price quality relationships, which we don't know how to replicate with public subsidies, right? So I mean I think starting to put all of that together. Uh, there are two fundamental issues that come to mind for research. One is, how are we going to set up, and who is going to do this stuff, of saying, do we want systems of accountability that are running through the government or that are running through parents? And that's a very old question, and how do we deal with this issue in general? And the second broad issue about, if we are worried about equity, do we have a way of generating uh, subsidies into uh, a, a private sector that will not run into the problems they've run into before. And in India, we have been saying that the private sector is exactly as inefficient as the public sector in direct proportion to the subsidies it receives, right? So uh, mm. let me leave it at that as, as, as kind of issues for.